Hey everyone, uh, my name's Andy from Finding Value Finance. I'll be your host today. Uh, we've got Shabam with us. Uh, we're here to talk oil, maybe a little bit natural gas, but mainly oil. And uh, thanks for coming on, Shabam. Really appreciate it. Coming on the channel. Yeah, good to see you again, Andy. Uh, apologies for my uh, tank top. I got a little busted arm today, so I will be in my unprofessional attire as I can uh, no longer put on my fancy shirts <laughs> for the next month. Okay. Well, sorry, sorry you got injured there, but um, I'll just start off with a pretty pretty broad question. Um, what's your current assessment of the markets in the oil space uh, at this current time? What are you seeing? What kind of information or news are you hearing about the, the oil markets right now? Yeah, you bet. So obviously pretty interesting times. We see WTI has uh, come up past 80 bucks after another kind of lull period. Uh, we saw the same, you know, quote, quote unquote lull period in the summer of 2023, where not much is happening. The paper markets are essentially absent from the market. And you see the physical market in the meantime look pretty good. You're continuing to draw stocks. You are continuing to uh, see strong demand. And really the paper market's not responding until they do. And then the price of the uh, barrel does continue going up. So I think, again, 2023 has caught, caught people off guard yet again. Um, I, I will be the first one to say that we were wrong on supply. Um, supply has come online a lot more than expected. We're talking U.S. shale. We're talking U.S. in general, which we'll get into here as the conversation continues. We're talking some extra Canadian barrels, Brazilian barrels, uh, Guyanese barrels. And of course, Iran has added a lot of barrels in uh, 2022, the latter half, and then 2023 going forward. So I think all in all, people have kind of uh, uh, lost interest in the thesis. They say, oh, hang on a sec, we got enough spare capacity, we got lots of extra barrels here, we see continued growth out of these different parts of the world, and we are in a high interest rate environment, we might be in a recessionary environment, therefore, we're going to table the thesis for now, and then we'll come back to it. Well, in the meantime, what's happened is every cause, there's an effect, every action, there's a reaction. You put the price of oil lower, well, you get more demand. You put the price of oil lower, you get less supply. So on the supply side, there's a couple of things that's happened. One is that a lot of uh, supply that came online in 2023 was surge supply due to the pricing in 2022. You put oil at $120 a barrel, while Joe Schmo, farmer out in the fields of Texas, goes and reactivates his well that was down for 10 years. And it comes back online at some sort of rate, and then it dies off. And there's a lot of drilling that got accelerated. There's a lot of DUCs that got accelerated. And all that was one time surge supply, which again, these are oil wells. The well doesn't just stay there, it starts declining. And when you have surge supply, that supply declines even faster. So we, we're we seeing that, that that world decline rate has got higher for that small period of time. And in the meantime, a lot of the one-time activities that happened in 2022 and in the first half of 2023 are no longer there. So the easy barrels have been brought back and anybody running the straight line analysis on supply coming online um, has sort of got stuck in, in that mindset. Uh, meanwhile, that supply has not continued coming online uh, throughout the latter half of 2023 and then into 2024. At the same time, demand has gone way higher than projected. So we're seeing certain areas of, uh, areas of the world continue to rebound. We see international jet fuel demand as a major factor. We see petrochemicals demand out of China as a major factor. We see the resurgence of domestic and uh, short haul travel in the uh, Southeast Asian and Northeast Asian markets. We see resurgence out of Europe after a very tough 2022. We see strong uh, rebounds in the gasoline and diesel markets um, out of Europe. And then we see just, just continued overall acceptance of a higher interest rate environment. When you look at the global industrial demand, when you look at the global freight traffic, you look at the global shipping traffic of, of total containers that are coming into the U.S. ports, we see a rebound from 2023. So the world has sort of gone accepted that, oh, we're, we're seeing the slowdown. In the meanwhile, people are saying, you know what? I'm tired of getting 5% or 6% in my bonds. I'm going to go and restart my construction spending. I'm going to go and restart my industrial spending. Uh, I'm going to go and restart my travel demand. And the other thing that's come out of all of this is that the revenge travel that we saw out of COVID has become almost a lifestyle. People have begun traveling more and more and more, and that's just how they are. They they now want to go and spend that extra dollar they have 
They don't want to save it, put it somewhere. They'd rather just keep spending that dollar. So the revenge travel has become an extended version of traveling. Uh, and we see this in, in, the, in the global gasoline demand, global jet fuel uh, demand, and a lot of resurgence still to go. People forget that there's, there's uh, flight routes that are still have not come back from pre-COVID. So as those come back, they're adding uh, an incremental demand to the general growth rate that we see. And just one, one point to make here, uh, I think India is going to be a very, very strong factor in 2024 and into the rest of the decade. People are saying two, three, four percent increase in oil demand year over year. We're seeing seven to eight percent increase year over year, and that's an extra two hundred thousand barrels. Well, you you play that out over the next five years, possibly an extra million barrels of demand, maybe even more, as that demand compounds um, as we really get into the bulk of this cycle um, going forward. So, looking at the demand side, and then maybe after that we can look at the supply side. Um, do you see strong demand? going forward for the next decade, five years, decade? Is it, I mean, were we just going to be doing a few percent each year? Is that kind of what you're seeing with the data that you look at? Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple of factors here. One is your resurgence of demand. So there is still parts of the world that have not fully rebounded from pre-COVID. There are certain parts, especially in Asia, certain countries have not, have not yet got back to their pre-COVID demand. Uh, and again, I, I keep highlighting jet fuel because that's a very good proxy for a country's overall rebound as they get these flight routes back online. I think that's that's the one portion that so far we can say, oh, the world is back to its regular growth rate. Well, no, because there is still a rebound that we have to get through in order to get to our regular growth rate. On top of that, there's countries that have gone into part of their S-curve that the world just doesn't have good data on. They go and they they pump out a growth rate on a certain country without realizing that as you go into that S-curve portion of your growth rate, you're going to see incrementally higher oil demand compared to your GDP growth. So again, I'll highlight India, I'll highlight Philippines, Vietnam. We look at some parts of Nigeria, huge population centers where we're talking multi-billions of people between these four countries where you see incredible growth rates, much higher than the GDP growth rate out of these countries. And you can see that not just in the gasoline or diesel or jet fuel, it's, it's across all the products. And those countries are gonna grow a lot faster today than America did, or than even China did, because more people there now have access to electricity, more people have access to the internet, more people out of there are traveling internationally and they want things faster than how America did it or how even China did it. Um, so, so I think really it's a, it's a really good place to be for, for global demand. And the one third sort of, uh, I would say, asterisk factor so far has not been really talked about is the oil producing countries. You talk about Brazil, we talk about Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Egypt, not, not huge population centers compared to the other uh, uh, portion that I just talked about, but these countries have, have experienced very low GDP growth for the last 10 years, given that they're highly reliant on the price of oil and commodities in general to grow their economies. Now that we see higher price for commodities and oil and natural gas, they're going to be pumping these dollars back into the economy. A lot of these countries have very young populations. Well, young populations want to grow, they want to start businesses, they want to work, and they want to consume. So as these countries get into the real uh, scope of things, you will see very, very high GDP growths out of these countries. They have to make up for essentially what was a lost decade and go and grow in a world that's now coming out of this COVID recessionary period, thus adding a lot of extra barrels, which I don't think the world is really uh, accounting for. So, so when people ask, how come OPEC plus uh, or OPEC has such a high demand growth rate compared to the IEA or the EIA or other agencies, it's because they see this. They see the excess growth out of the population centers in Asia, and they see excess growth out of their own internal economies because they're throwing that dollar back into the ground. Uh, well, they're not throwing the dollar back in the ground for oil. They're throwing the dollar back into the ground for their economies to grow. Uh, the last thing you want is a angry uh, young population with pitchforks. Uh, has not historically worked out very well for the people in power. So we've got... Robust demand, obviously, is what it sounds like over the next 
as far as the eye can see. What about the supply side? Um, <clears throat> I, I read uh, Goring and Rosenzweig saying that they're thinking that the Middle East, uh, specifically Saudi Arabia, uh, could potentially be peaking in production uh, with maybe 50-ish percent of what the reserves have left. Uh, they're, they're basically about halfway or slightly over halfway of their reserves is what they're saying. Do you think that the Middle East, one, are they actually adhering to these cuts that they first said? So number one, are they adhering to the cuts? And number two, do you think they have spare capacity left in your opinion? Yeah, so a lot of comments here on this one. So uh, the, of course, the GNR latest article came out talking about the Saudi Arabia production capacity, uh, 12 million versus 13 million, their own view as to uh, what they see that that meaning, their own, own analysis. Um, I'm, I'm sort of somewhere in the middle on the analysis. The So just for the viewers that may, may, may not have read it, first of all, I would say go read the, the article, of course, uh, but also in their in their article assumptions, they're assuming that the smaller fields are completely non-existent. I think not not really a good assumption to make uh, because some of the smaller fields, you know, Saudi Arabia may not target them today, but 10, 15, 20 years down the road, now it makes sense for them to target these smaller fields similar to how we've done this in Canada and in North America. Also, they assume that any oil past 2070 is not there. Um, again, not really an assumption that I agree with because we are going to be producing oil past 2070. As, as far out as it seems, we may be producing 20 million barrels. We may be producing 50 million barrels. There's going to be some portion of it. The same with that coal, we're at record coal demand right now. Uh, the oil the oil chart is still going to continue uh, no matter what. So, so, so the assumptions are slightly off. I think if they said we're going to take 50% of these reserves, uh, on both topics, it would have been a better way to do it. But either way, um, the the analysis is out there. You can see that in general, once you produce half of a field's reserves, you hit the peak and it starts declining. Now, the the the, the Saudi Arabian Gawar field has already started declining. Their granddaddy super giant field has gone from that 5 million barrels peak to about 3.8. Now, we don't know the exact number, but 3.2 is the estimate today as to what it's producing. So as a whole, uh, Saudi Arabia might not be at peak, but their major fields are beyond the peak. Um, and there's other technical challenges and costs that come with that. You, you don't just get to produce at the same uh, dollar per barrel of lifting cost, nor can you say for sure that we don't, we don't have any major problems. Um, you know, look at the Cantarell field in Mexico, producing very nicely and then completely died off because of problems with nitrogen injection and just poor reservoir management. Um, these are very technically challenging fields once they get to late stage. In the early stage, oh, you poke a well in the ground and it starts gushing out oil, sure. But as, as they get into their later stage, uh, you see definitely more problems. So that's kind of the aside as to the article uh, first. Are they adhering to the quotas? So every country, basically except Iraq, is being adhering to the quotas. Uh, I would say even Russia, despite all the discussion around them beating quotas and whatnot, they are still under the quota. It sounds like their production is going to further decline now with some of the uh, attacks on the refineries. Uh, Saudi Arabia, obviously under quota. The UAE, obviously Kuwait. Uh, Iran is does not have a quota. So even though their production is going up, they're still within the means. And then Iraq is saying that they're going to go in and make up for the excess in the next months. Um, they also don't seem to want to solve this Kurdistan-Turkey pipeline issue. So they're they're using that as one of the ways to restrict the uh, barrels. And then I think they will continue on and um, hopefully make up for this as the months go on. But in the meantime, they, you know, the, the world is still at a, at a, looks like a deficit in 2024 uh, thus far, even with Iraq overproducing uh, on their barrels. So I think overall, the OPEC plus as a whole is underproducing, but there is a certain uh, couple of countries that are maybe overproducing, um, not not really uh, to a major extent. Again, OPEC plus as a whole is underproducing um, as, as a whole. Where is the spare capacity? Saudi Arabia and UAE, that's it. You have maybe a million half barrels in Saudi Arabia. 
If you add in surge capacity, can they produce this for three months? Sure. Maybe you have 2 million of spare capacity. You've got the UAE with, you could argue, over a million barrels of spare capacity. The UAE has the newest reservoirs, including some of their offshore reservoirs. And these are brand new fields that they've developed. They put capital in and they haven't produced. The UAE quota is notoriously under what their actual production capacity is because of the dollars they've put into that over the last decade. And they have the newest fields. So the most easy to produce fields, uh, the, the easiest to bring on fields um, going forward. So those are the two places where I would say the most obvious spare capacity is. You could argue that Kuwait in the neutral zone with Saudi Arabia has some excess. You could argue that Iran could bring some online, maybe another 500,000 with some significant capital spending put in. And then Iraq has some awesome reservoirs which they could bring online, but require incredible spending. So Total, I believe now is back in Iraq. Uh, the West Kurna fields, uh, the Majnoon fields could bring on some, some barrels, but that's over a phase period of time. They they could not just go in and bring that on today um, uh, at, at, at current environment uh, to bring that on. And I think Saudi Arabia and UAE are, are working very close together as much as they are uh, independent countries they're working very close together to control this spare capacity uh, moving forward. So I think those those are sort of the current situation of the market. And I will remind the viewers, we have never had zero spare capacity in the world. So for you to go and say, oh, we got 5 million of spare capacity, therefore the oil market could never go to X amount per barrel uh, is, is just a completely false statement. In 2012 to 2014, we were still maintaining 2 million barrels globally, maybe 3 million barrels globally, of spare capacity. So the world has always maintained excess capacity. Uh, the one big step change is in the past bull cycle, 2010 to 14, Saudi Arabia maintained spare capacity for the world. They kept spare capacity and they said, look, if the world suffers from some emergency geopolitical problem or some reservoir damage somewhere, we'll come in and we'll produce this. And they also maintained 275 million barrels of crude in their tanks. Now what they're saying is, no, we're, we're not the world's spare capacity. We're just our spare capacity. And we'll give it up when we want to give it up. We don't, we don't necessarily are here to subsidize the world if need be. And what's another example of that? Well, they've drained their reserves, uh, uh, their crude stocks. They've gone from keeping 275 million barrels of oil in their tanks to about 140 million barrels of crude in their tanks. They're saying, no, if the world's going to you know, be lackadaisical about this and they're going to dilly-dally around, Okay, and the U.S. shale producers want to come in and smack us around. Well, do it, and you guys take over the world's emergency uh, uh, person to be when the time comes, because we're just going to maintain what we want to maintain for our goals, and that's where we are. So, again, to reiterate the point, the world has never gone to zero spare capacity. You cannot take that entire uh, barrels as being a excess number. It's like anything in your house. You don't you don't keep five extra rolls of toilet paper as like, oh, we're going to deploy all of these before we go to the store. You keep an extra two or three and, and then you go to the store to refill while you still still have those as your spare. So just keep that in mind going forward. I see this a, a uh, misunderstanding of this spare capacity uh, mantra. And then remember, the world is running out of spare capacity in terms of excess barrels. So even though we may have spare capacity of uh, supply, we don't have it in inventory anymore. Much lower Chinese barrels, much lower SPR, much lower Saudi barrels, much lower product stocks, and much lower floating storage than we have had in the past. Staying on the supply side, looking at North America, specifically shale, um, what's your opinions around shale right now? Are we getting close to a peak? Do we still have some more left? What, what, what do you think about the supply side there? Oh, the trillion dollar question that people mm -hmm. have got absolutely smashed trying to answer uh, mm -hmm. for the last 10 years. So I think, you know, again, coming into 2023, there was a thesis, okay, 2023 is the year shale production goes down. We meet one half of our structural bull thesis baseline. OPEC plus is in control. We met the other half of our structural bull thesis baseline. One happened, the other didn't. Looks like US production kept rising. 
looks like OPEC plus is in control. So we've got 50% of it right. But what's happened in the meantime? The EIA has gone from overstating production to, well, it's gone from understating production to overstating production. What does that mean? When you look at the year over year growth rates, it's completely uh, out to lunch because you were under promising what they were producing at to begin with, actual production was higher. Now actual production is lower. Therefore the year over year change is a lot lower than people think. They've got this million barrels per day growth in their mind. The real growth may be 600,000, 700,000 of growth that came out. Where did the growth come from? The Bakken. The Bakken grew 200,000 barrels on the back of an absolute immense drop-off in DUCs. The Eagleford grew 100,000, 150,000 on the backdrop of an immense drawdown in DUCs. The Gulf of Mexico grew 150,000, 200,000 based on projects that were sanctioned many years ago. These projects came online. The Gulf of Mexico has huge projects, 30, 40, 50,000 barrel projects, FPSOs tie-ins that came online, added to barrels, and we saw the entire community go and say, oh, hang on, it must be the Permian. It must be the Permian that grew, nothing else can grow. But when you add up all the Permian producers, they've all reported Q4s. You can look what they produce in Q4 2023. You can look at what they produce in Q4 2022. Some of the private producers did grow. Crown Quest, Endeavor, Mewborn. Yes, we agree they did grow. But as the, the, the Permian as a whole did not grow 600,000 or 700,000 barrels. The DUCs are now gone in the Bakken and the Eagleford. So what happened was 2022, we drew down the Permian DUCs, drilled uncompleted wells. You look at 2023, there's very little drawdown in the Permian DUCs because whatever is left is your uneconomical DUCs or the dud wells. The Bakken and the Eagleford were the second to be capitalized. People put money into the Permian, and then the Bakken and Eagleford were next. They've drawn down their DUCs throughout 2023. Now that is at a set standstill. The rig counts are still down. The frack fleet counts are down 30 year over year, which is about 12 to 15 percent year over year. The rig counts are down 10 to 15 to 20 percent year over year. We're now at this lower stage. Companies that have shown you their 2024 numbers, there's companies like Devon and ExxonMobil saying our 2024 H1 shale production will be lower than the 2023 Q4 production. They're, they're flat out telling you what they're doing. You read the conference calls. So where a step change, we see Goldman and Morgan Stanley put out very interesting uh, production data just last week showing that shale is down 400,000 barrels per day. Not, not quite correct. I think there's, there's a lot of noise in the data but essentially shale has gone, US oil production has gone from this growing slash flatline phase to now a drawing down phase. It may not continue going down throughout the year. There is gonna be capital put in, there's gonna be wells that come online. It, it's not gonna go down throughout the year, but the hyper growth phase is definitely over. And the data will come out month over month. It's the boy who cried wolf, but now the wolf have, act have actually showed up and it's not just one wolf, it's a pack of wolves that are here. You have a growing base. You have a much larger base of barrels that need to be made up with a lower rig count. Again, the rig count being down 10% is not just on a flat level of production. Production is still up five, 600,000 from last year. So you have more barrels and more decline to make up with a lower amount of rigs and a lower amount of frack spreads. So the thesis has not changed. It's just behind the scenes, the data has changed. The reasons for the growth of last year are not well understood by the general investment community. Everything just gets put, oh, shale, shale, shale and Permian must have grown. Well, not, not entirely. And even within the Permian, we see activity shifting from the Delaware back into the Midland Basin. We see the Delaware Basin getting overcapitalized with its hard decline rates. We see drilling move from the Wolf Camp A and B and the Sprayberry into the Wolf Camp D, the Wolf Camp C, into the Dean zone. So ENPs are having to be forced to move into secondary and tertiary targets. Some of these wells are still fantastic, but they're more expensive, they're deeper, 
there's more water, there's more gas, and there's not as much inventory. The wolf camp A and B and the sprayberry are across almost the entire basin. The D and the wolf camp C and D are only in certain parts of the basin. So essentially you've gone from drilling a tier three wolf camp A well to a tier one Dean well. Well, your Dean only has three months or six months of inventory and it's much more expensive and it's much deeper. So companies are forced to throttle their production. They're forced to not go in and, and drill these uh, zones up nonstop. And you see this with the M&A activity that's been going on. Companies that are have inventory are just saying, you know what, let's sell now while the valuations are good. The companies that are buying are saying, well, hang on a sec, we need to buy more inventory right now before things get absolutely crazy. And before we start declining production uh, going forward, at the same time, you see the private private corporations and the high growth public corporations say, we're not going to grow. High peak energy grew 75% oil barrels year over year, 2023. They're guiding to a decline of 10% in 2024. It's, it, it's not a, we grew 80%, now we're going to grow 40%. It's we grew 80%, now we're going to decline 10%. And you can see how you take that you take the entire basin, you see wall productivity continue to degrade and how we can go from a growth phase to a stable phase to a declining phase um, very, very rapidly, especially as DUCs have run out and we're at lower frac and rig counts. If that rig count starts to ramp up, this entire thesis has to be looked at again. So far, we see no evidence that higher prices is bringing on uh, extra rigs and Meanwhile, the Permian continues to drop the uh, 10,000 barrels uh, per day, day after day after day. You've got to make up 10,000 barrels per day to keep your production flat. That's that. That's the end all be all uh, that doesn't change. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting time because you you end up getting shot at for being wrong for six months or for a year, not realizing that there's an even bigger problem because of being wrong in 2023. And, you know, the, there's there's going to be pushback saying, well, you said the same thing from 2014 to 2020. Sure. But in those years, the data never matched what people were saying. Well, productivity continued to rise. New zones were continually being found. New, new private ENPs were continued to be funded in those years. Those trends have all not just stopped, they've reversed. And the data is beginning to play in what I'm saying's favor. And... Hey, if you keep saying the boy who cried wolf, well, keep saying it because uh, the wolves are out there and it's better to pay attention and be ready than to call the person a liar and then you get completely overrun. But uh, that's a uh, human nature. So so let me let me recap this. Let me see if I have this right. So we had prices go up 2020, 2021. We had this big move. They blamed it on Russia in the war, whatever. We sucked down inventory from that point to kind of where we are today. We've just been draining inventory onshore, offshore, SPR barrels, on and on and on and on. That got drained down to a certain level. Then we basically started draining our drilled uncompleted wells in the shales. We started maybe draining them wherever else in the world. We're kind of draining all that stuff that we already drilled in 2020 and whatnot. So now we're kind of sitting at the low point, would you say, in terms of inventory and also inventory of drilled and uncompleted wells. Is that a fair assessment to say? Yes. And I think the the really the point here, you you had the nail on the head, is between 2014 and 2020, the world built up a lot of insurance. So other than previous cycles of oil markets, the world had a lot of excess DUCs and excess inventory that got built up between those years. There was wells that never came online during those years. So so let's not even talk about DUCs, but wells that, that went down. I have a 20 barrel per day well that went down, oil price is 50 bucks, I'm not gonna bring it online. It stays offline for 10 years. There's a large inventory of these wells that were sitting out there that got brought online in 2022. So in short, the world built up a lot of insurance and extra surge capacity and spare capacity during those years, much more than you would see in a normal oil cycle. So those three aspects you you discussed, plus the inventory of work over wells has more or less been drained down to its uh, low point of the cycle because $80 oil is still enough 
for a lot of those wells to be brought online. $80 oil is still enough for a DUC well to be fracked where you've already sunk cost the drilling portion of it. So I think this is the exact point that uh, is going to catch a lot of people off guard. They're, they're, they're misconstruing excess supply and added barrels as new production when it's not new production it's it's a one time ad but that one time ad was so large because of the lower for longer cycle lasted so many years that it got portrayed as as new production and uh it plays into the oil bull thesis very strongly because when we say there's a higher for longer cycle coming this is the reason for it the the world fails to believe what has happened and they are putting the new supply the, the reasoning for the new supply into the wrong category um, and nobody cares to listen because, oh, the, the oil bull just must just be stupid and he's just coping for what's happened. Well, okay, the, 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 that's fine because the, my dollar is still invested where it was last year and the year before, given the underlying uh, uh, reasoning for the added supply is not a valid reasoning um, in, in my opinion. So yeah, very, very interesting um, place to be. And I guess I'll add a side comment to this is people are saying the paper markets are not supporting oil price and the, 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 the lower inventories are not reflected in the price of oil. Well, I'll, I'll offer sort of a out of the box thinking, if you will, uh, idea here. When we were at these levels of paper barrels in the past, the price of oil was 40 bucks or 50 bucks. So why is the price of oil today $80 at the same level of paper positioning? It's because it's the physical markets are in somewhat adding to the price of oil there. So the physical markets being how tight they are have already brought the price of oil up compared to where they were at the same level of paper positioning three or four or five years ago. So you're seeing the paper market, uh, the, the physical markets pushing this price of oil up with no, absolutely no um, support from the paper markets. So what happens when the paper markets start coming up? What happens when more people start buying paper barrels as interest rates drop or just that physical barrel gets so tight that now your base is $90 a barrel, even with no support from the paper market? So you almost got to reverse psychology this. You got to stop asking, why is there no geopolitical risk? Why is there no paper market support? You got to think of it as the physical market has already pushed the price up. And as you continue to drain inventories, it will continue to push the price up. And then you have the double whammy effect. What happens as the paper barrels uh, start to get real excited about the price of oil? Well, what happened to, in 2008? You saw a price go from $90 to 147 basically overnight because the paper market said, oh, hang on a sec, there's a major problem here and we have to push this thing up. Um, sure, there's other factors on the global financial scale that, that ended up pushing it that far high, uh, but there's gonna be something that breaks and in the same way that's going to cause paper markets to start buying oil barrels. Oil, energy, commodities, precious metals, it's all the same thing. You, you're buying energy. And that's that's what, where the end game sort of lies. Is it going to happen all in one day? No, it's going to be a slow, slow moving wreck that ends up looking slow moving to the outsider, to the investor. Uh, it's going to be a very fast moving, uh, uh, very interesting time to be a large holder in these uh, equities or or the or the commodity um, because the companies are vastly superior now than they were ten years ago. They're they're just in such a better position, and yeah, I think that's the essentially the structural bull thesis in a in a you know fifteen to forty five second clip is uh, it's going to be a very very interesting time. Uh, we've 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 lost all our insurance policies, and in the meantime, the physical market has moved up the price of oil. And nobody seems to have noticed that we are at the same positioning as when price was $40 a barrel. Um, in some cases, our positioning is even lower now. So the paper markets are even supporting the price of oil less, yet the price is way higher. So what's causing it? Something to think about, uh, both as a participant in the oil market or as somebody who's on the outside looking in, uh, questioning what's going on. Here's another question I, I would I would say or maybe a, a, the setup uh, so as we progress through this cycle we basically drained the dukes we've drained the inventory and all that stuff so now as an investor are we expecting to see price go up from here 
the price hit a certain level and then we'll see the rig count start to, to move. Cause right now we're seeing rig counts kind of sideways to even slightly drop recently, at least the ones that, that I follow. Um, what, what's kind of the expectations going forward here? Higher prices, rig count comes up and then we stare at the shale oil. Uh, we'll, we'll say uh, what the supply is to see if that actually rolls over, even if rig count continues to go up. I mean, what's kind of the expectations and what should we expect going forward from where we are today? Yeah, and I think there, therein lies the rub, I would say, is, uh, you know, people will will look at your um, pro projection or some sort of expectation and fail to account for the fact that this is a dynamic market. If you see 100 rigs added, well, and and then you say, oh, your projection was false. Well, the, the, the projection changes as rigs get added. The projection changes as demand continues to surprise in certain parts of the world. The, the projection changes depending on the price of oil. If the price of oil hits, our, hits, hits 120 bucks, can the Permian grow? Well, poss possibly, because everything will start to get drilled up. So the, the projection will be obviously accurate as of today. So what, what I think is going to happen, and this is kind of an opinion-based answer, is the U.S. producers are not going to react. They are going to wait for OPEC spare capacity to come down because they know there's excess barrels being held off the market today that if they start ramping up drilling, well, they got bit. They got bit in 2022, ramping up drilling. They ramped up too far, too fast. And then they had to start dropping rigs. They had to get out of contracts. They ended up selling their barrels for much lower than they wanted to sell them for. They ended up growing too fast even past infrastructure capacity in certain cases. So the, the US shale is not going to be the one that reacts. I don't think it's gonna be the Canadian oil sands either. I don't think it's gonna be deep water offshore either. Deep water offshore is gonna to continue to get dollars just because that's the next frontier. It's not gonna materially ramp up unless we see higher sustained pricing. Well, before we see sustained pricing, OPEC will have to add barrels. And when I say sustained pricing, I, I'm saying, north of $90, north of $100 a barrel for six months. Can we see that before OPEC adds barrels? I'm not 100% certain. I think OPEC plus will add barrels before we see that for six months. So what's gonna happen? Well, OPEC plus is gonna add barrels. They're gonna add barrels into the demand portion of the equation. 2025 is gonna be a very interesting year because Brazil is adding a lot of barrels in 2025 as far as their FPSO uh, forward-looking statement goes, Kazakhstan is going to add some barrels in 2025. Their fields that are being run by Chevron are going through some very interesting projects, can add about 350,000 barrels in 2025. So it's really time we start looking at the whole cycle now. There's there's things that, oh, this, this is not a near-term problem. Well, there is projects that are going through that can add barrels in 2025, 2026. It's time that oil bulls start focusing on these projects because there are our conventional long lead supply projects that are coming to fruition. So 2025, are we gonna get there without a major supply problem? That's where the jury is out. We we may not end up getting to that point. So either way, that's, that's a side point that we need to look at. But once OPEC starts adding barrels, brings up price oil slightly down, you're gonna see continued barrels being consumed. Uh, keep in mind, 2024 is a huge year for refining capacity additions for the global market. There's a lot of refining capacity being added. It's refineries that consume crude, not the consumer. So the price of oil can go a little bit higher. The crack spreads can come down a little bit more with added refining capacity. So th these are all side points. The price of oil goes up, OPEC add, adds barrels. At some point, the price of oil goes up again. What do the U.S. shale producers do? The Again, one of the other trillion dollar questions. Are they going to actually add rigs? Well, based on the statements being made right now, it doesn't seem like any price is going to do it. They, they're more so interested in inventory conservation. They're more so interested in free cash flow, keeping their production profiles flat. Are you going to see NGL production increase as they move to gassier acreage? Yes. Are you going to see oil production increase? Not necessarily out of the Permian, the Bakken, or the Eagleford. At the higher prices, you may see rigs getting put into the Utica Shale Basin. 
into the scoop and stack, into perhaps Alaska, some projects over there, perhaps into the Wyoming area. You're going to see maybe further push to try and get some barrels out of California. You're going to see the rigs moving into the other basins is what I'll call them. And that's where you'll you'll really see growth. I don't see rigs being added in the Bakken, the Eagleford, or the Permian in any sort of near-term fashion, uh, unless you see you know, price go absolutely through the roof and stay there for a period of time. The other comment here to be made, there's no longer acreage for private equity to buy. You, you're essentially at the extent of the basin. You're seeing companies like Bayswater, Surge Operating, uh, High Peak, Apache. They're really going into the depths of the of the fringes of the uh, Delaware and the Midland already. Therefore, they're not going to go and uh, these private equity companies can no longer just buy acreage and start exploiting it, even if it's a lower quality acreage. It just doesn't exist. So what are you going to throw money at? Well, there's there's nothing to throw money at unless you buy acreage from the current producers. Well, the current producers are selling it to you at $130,000 a flowing barrel. Where is the money to be made by buying acreage at that type of valuation? So I think this is really, again, the step change that's occurred. The owners of the acreage don't want to grow. And the private equity that would want to fund all this, you can't buy acreage. It, it just doesn't exist in the Permian, the Bakken, or the Eagleford. It exists in other areas. And sure, you're going to start to see exploitation in other parts of the U.S. Um, are they going to find good stuff? Possibly. Never, never bet against America but you would require a higher price for longer and you would have to see a capitalization of which we didn't see in 2022. Even in 2022, we did not see companies get financed the same way that they were getting financed in 2016 and 2017, despite the price of oil being three X as high as what it was in 2016 and 2017. So there's a general mindset change and private equity is always out there. They, they, they are always out there looking to deploy capital, but they will require a higher price for longer and they will require a new acreage being developed somewhere so they can pile in and start finding it. And are these new acreages gonna be as big as the Permian? Likely not. We have not found something that big with that much stacked pay and that much original infrastructure already in place. What's most likely gonna happen, they go and finance enhanced oil recovery projects. They go and look into Alaska and try and fund projects. They go and look offshore Gulf of Mexico and try to do more exploration drilling. That's what's gonna happen. And guess what? All of those take time. Compared to going and capitalizing Permian, tomorrow you can start drilling. It takes time to go and do these other activities. And that's the time frame in which these companies absolutely print money. You and I start buying our uh, money filled mansions and then we exit the trade as those barrels from these three things come online uh, at some future point in time. So a lot of things there to discuss. And all in the meanwhile, I will say, oil bulls, keep an eye on the long lead projects that have been financed. Guyana, Norway, Brazil, Kazakhstan, Canada, even to some extent. Keep an eye on these projects because it's not just shale. There's other barrels that are being financed behind the scenes that we absolutely cannot get caught by. These are huge barrel projects. Brazil is scheduled to add 600,000 BOE per day, mostly oil of capacity in 2025. That is a very large number. We need to keep an eye on these projects as they come online, what they come on at, and how much are they actually adding to supply versus decline mitigation. Canada can add a lot of barrels through these smaller, smaller, smaller thermal projects the IPCO sanctioned black rod, the uh, de-bottlenecking on the oil sands. There's barrels that get smushed through that if we don't pay attention, uh, we could have some extra barrels getting added that we're not paying attention to and uh, really need to going forward. So uh, forget demand. Demand's rising way higher than people think. We, we don't really need to focus on demand as much. Supply is where you need to focus on. It's always excess supply that kills a structural bull cycle. It's never been a destruction of demand. Even in 2008, demand really never went down that much. Global oil demand, even in 2020, at, at, at the absolute once in a lifetime, once in a generation, uh, once in a 500 year uh, response to a virus, demand went down 20%. Okay, the, the world will continue to tick along and rebound from that. 
focus on supply moving forward. So with all the decline rates that we're seeing throughout the world and, and shale oil in the United States, because that's, from what I understand, the majority of growth came from shale and they've got some pretty wicked decline rates. Do we have the barrels of oil that are coming on? Are they coming on and adding actual real barrels to the total supply or are they just making up some of the difference in that decline rate over these next few years? Because I, I think we're close enough where the decline rates could really, you know, at, at some point we're going to start treading water. So the new stuff coming on is just going to offset the decline rates that we have existing uh, in the world. So are we actually going to make growth in the supply or are we just offsetting the declines that we have out there? Kind of what, what what's your opinions around that? Because you, I'll just restate it. You said that a bull market in oil is destroyed by increased supply. Uh, what I'm saying is, how close are we to maybe peaking out on the supply side? Is is really the question. Yeah. So I think absolutely fantastic. Uh, th there's no clear cut answer today as we speak. Uh, it depends on the country. So Mexico, for example, the they have been unable to mitigate their decline rate, even with adding new barrels. You're, you're unable to mitigate your existing decline rate. Kazakhstan, I think they're going to add barrels because their their, their existing fields, the Kashagan and the Tengiz, are, are are such prolific fields. They don't really decline. You're 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 just producing from a reservoir that's there, and you're adding barrels. The Canadian oil sands, they don't really decline. You're just adding barrels. Now there is some Canadian oil sand mines that are getting to the close of their productive life. Suncor Base Mine would be one example where you're getting to the almost the end of your productive capacity and that those barrels might just completely drop off. But for the most part, lower decline asset, you're going to see barrels being added. The U.S. Gulf of Mexico, I think, is going to have trouble. The, the, the future projects that are coming online are basically just making up for the decline. They may not even make up for the decline. You look at Guyana, those are all fresh barrels. You look at Iraq, a lot of fresh barrels. Saudi Arabia, maybe just making up for their decline rate. We look at other countries like the UK, for example, straight down. There's no decline mitigation. There's no barrels being really added. Norway, lucky. They found the Johan Sverdup field. So they've somewhat mitigated their decline. But going forward, they're going to have a peak in 2025. Production is going to start dropping again, maybe 100,000 barrels a year, maybe 150,000 barrels a year. And so each country is in its own little phase. Um, globally, where are we? I think we're doing pretty well at making up for the losses. But really, when, when you add all of these things up, it comes down to shale. If, if the Permian starts declining 200, 300, 400,000 barrels a year, we got a major problem on our hands because it's not just one year. It's a compounded effect year after year after year that leads to this growth wedge, this, this wedge of supply demand uh, imbalance getting larger and larger. And guess what? Sure, you can go and finance a project to go and make up for that wedge, but that's not gonna come online for two, three, four, five years. So that meanwhile, that imbalance remains. And what have you done? You've gone and blown through your excess inventory of oil in the world. You've gone and blown through your DUCs. You've blown through half your SPR the world just has to continue draining inventories or throttle demand to the point that people stop consuming. That's where we make the money. The, the bulk of the money is not made when the bull market is 100% there. The bulk of the money is made getting into the bull market as the valuations rise, as money flows pile in, as fund flows pile in, ETFs start buying, hedge funds start buying. That's where the bulk of the money is made. Once you're at the top of the cycle, look at the... the uh, return on major Canadian oil and gas companies from 2012 to 2014. A bunch of them actually lost money in a $100 oil environment because they were already trading at 10 times cash flow. They were already trading at the max of their the, the money they could put back into the ground and their growth rates. There, there was nothing else that could be done. There's only so many prospects out there in the world. So this is a very important point, And I'm glad we got to this stage. People that think, oh, once oil is hundred bucks, for two years, I'll just buy in and make my money. You're gonna make no money. You might end up losing money by being part of an oil bull cycle. The money's made getting there. And that's why 
I'll just speak for myself. I'm so patient getting to that because once it's obvious, it's already obvious. The money's already been made. The, the easy money has already been made. Now you're going and chasing exploration plays. You're trying to chase uh, absolute junk prospects. You're trying to make money in a bull market. That's where you end up getting these people that get scammed into, oh, we got this uh, epic reservoir here and there. And uh, it ends up being just some random farmer's field uh, moves pasture that is being marketed. So yeah, so I think that this is a very important point uh, to keep track of is um, a lot of the money is going to be made getting up there. And when do we get there? Well, we don't, we don't entirely know, but the, the factors and the credentials and the parameters are there setting us up to get there. And the longer that people don't believe you, the more obvious it's going to be that we are going to get there because the more that people are unwilling to finance oil, the more that people are, are unwilling to invest in these companies, the more they will go and buy back their own stock rather than putting that dollar in the ground. And the more they will pay money into dividends rather than explore and, 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 and sanction projects. Well, the longer they keep doing that, the more money people are going to make on the equity side, but also the, the less supply that comes online when we need it most. And I think that's the hallelujah moment. It, every oil bull cycle, people make multi-generational wealth. This is not a opinion. This is a fact. And the best way to make even more money out of that is to compound your returns. So you go and you, you make your money in one part of the sector, and then you go and take it out and you put it in a different part of the sector, possibly junior growth companies, possibly the OFS, maybe the deep water drillers. Maybe you put it into a frontier market, exploration plays, whatever it is. Uh, as long as you can pick and choose the ones that you go into, that's how you can make a uh, returns that just don't even make sense from any sort of perspective. And uh, yeah, I think I'm just rambling here, but I think it's it's also important to keep in mind, you are going to have down years in an oil bull market. If you're willing to sustain and stay in the market for the entirety of the bull market, or as we get into the bull market, you are going to have years where you know you get spat on and you get kicked while you're down. And that's just the reality of the market. The, this is how you make a huge uh, returns. And I'm not saying huge returns because you're taking risk. It's huge returns just because of the way the world and money flows and human nature works. Is a they, They're unwilling to accept the cycle because guess what everybody in the world wants? Cheap gasoline. Guess what we want? Expensive gasoline. It's very few of us going against the 8 billion people on earth. So keep your head up and uh, the few that make it to the other side are uh, the ones that uh, have fun. I guess I'll put it that way. <laughs> Another quick question. Uh, you say the boil, oil bull market and all this stuff. Where are we exactly in the oil bull market? Are we still early, middle, or more towards the end, in your opinion? Well, I think we're definitely in an oil bull market. We, we're in a market where you see supply and demand are relatively same. You could go and make the case that, oh, if, if OPEC flooded the market, then uh, we would have uh, billions of barrels of excess inventory. Yeah, you are correct. But the structural bull market, the baseline of it is that OPEC is back in control. The reason being, once again, OPEC is not trying to generate the maximum dollar for its barrel. OPEC is trying to maintain a structurally sustainable oil market. If they crash the market now and they add billions of barrels of extra oil and the supply gets absolutely clobbered, what happens five years down the road? Now, now you create an even bigger growth, uh, an even bigger wedge between supply and demand. So it's a complete false narrative to think, oh, if OPEC just added barrels, we'd be okay. Well, you'd be okay for a couple of years. Yeah. And then what? The entire shale patch would get absolutely decimated. Projects deep water would get decimated you'd see funding pulled for almost every project out there. And then what? So it's just not a proper way to, to think about these things uh, that, oh, there's just excess capacity. Therefore, uh, we cannot possibly be in a bull market. So we, we are in a bull market. Companies are making lots of cash. I think we are in a, what I would call a positioning stage of the bull market. The early returns have been made. Certain companies have gone on and got incredibly high valuations. Certain companies and subsectors are suffering with low valuations, and it's now up to you to decide where you want to be. Where are you going to pos position yourself as this bull market goes? 
if you think we're going to stay in an $80 oil for 10 years before we hit the bull market, you're going to buy different kinds of equities. If you think we hit $120 this year, you're going to buy different equities. If you think it's a slow growth as the next couple of years goes on, you're going to buy different kinds of equities. So it's a it's a portfolio positioning portion of the bull market. It's a sort of a I don't I don't really know what what the proper um, example for it to be, but but it's almost like a Formula One race. Let's say you've done your qualifying, you see which cars are doing well, you've got the order. There's certain cars that are really high up, certain cars are down, but the one at the bottom might have the best engine in case there's a rainy day. The one at the bottom of the podium or or the bottom of the qualifying grid has the rainy tires on already, knowing that there's a chance of rain. So that that might be the one to pick because you've looked at the forecast and you've gone and figured out there is going to be rain. So so that's kind of where we are. We've, we've done the qualifying. We've gone on and proven ourselves in in that. And now the race starts. Well, when does the race start? It's it's not quite started yet, but we're going towards the green uh, yellow light and then the second yellow light and then the green light. So we're somewhere in that phase. I don't think the whole baseball example is going to apply anymore. We just lost the 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 innings example. I think is we we have no idea where we are in the innings, uh, unfortunately. But I actually like this example uh, because that's where we are. Pick your horse. And uh, when that race starts, when that gun is fired, um, it's going to be, we'll see who, who ends up winning um, because it's it's going to be a long drawn out race. It, it's no longer going to be the six months in and we make a millions of dollars and we move on type of cycle. It's going to be a, a slow, slow grind up. Uh, but that slow grind, because the companies are so strong and they're so undervalued, the slow grind up in crude price could be a multiple expansion type of return on the equity side of things. And I think that's where the fun of the market is. I'm I'm no longer buying companies at 10 times cash flow. I'm buying companies at two times cash flow, three times cash flow that have a bit of leverage on them, but not insane leverage that they get absolutely destroyed. Um that's a very safe, comfortable, good place to be. And if you, you know, if you're of the belief that oil price could be $60 tomorrow and what should I buy? I don't think there's any company that's going to survive uh, in terms of the equity valuation perspective. They might not go bankrupt, but you're still going to get absolutely slapped around on your uh, uh, market value versus book value um, on those on those corporations. So, yeah, they're, they're they're all all the cars are in the race. If you think that they're all going to crash and die, well, then maybe you should not be betting on any of the race anyway. So, um, yeah. So I think that's a maybe a unique answer compared to the, the the previous times I've answered that question um, and the response, yeah. Anything else you'd like to share with the oil markets that I haven't asked already? Yeah, I think just, just keep in mind that every action has a reaction. Natural gas, people are not happy. Well, the uh, US natural gas production just printed a cycle low today. So every action has an opposite reaction. Don't Don't just say, Oh, natural gas price can be low forever because of the supply and this and that. You, you've seen EQ, uh, EQT come out. You've seen Chesapeake come out, make statements. You've seen Devon come out, talk about lowering oil production. You've got High Peak come out and talk about the change in their growth rate. You've got you got to look at the factors behind the scenes. And this is a dynamic market. You know, just because you were correct yesterday, just because you've been correct for the last six months. Um, I mean, I I enjoy Twitter just as much as everybody else. I enjoy going and and you know gloating and talking about returns you you there's certain people that enjoy kicking other people when they're down um this is an absolutely brutal market so it will it, it will make you millions and millions of dollars and when you're at your worst it will come and slap you in the face so you know the, you got to get ready for the waves we're surfing on a on an absolutely uh highest waves in the world and uh you know you got to enjoy the ride while you're getting there be cognizant of what's going on understand the companies you invest in, understand the macro. I believe the few oil bulls left are very, very knowledgeable about the market. Uh, they're very knowledgeable about the companies they're in, but there is gonna be at some point new people entering the sector. So as as you're somebody maybe who's newer, make a very, very good uh, idea of what you're investing in and how long you're gonna be here and the macro and everything else. Because uh, if it's not the markets that wear you down, it's the people that are, uh, uh, going out and, and in your ear on the one side and in the, in the ear on the other side 
that's going to wear you down. So um, I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the game only ends when the game ends and uh, you know, it's uh, the, the game is still ongoing and we're going to see how it goes. So yeah, I think just, just keep an eye out for, for structural changes that are occurring behind the scenes while you have higher prices, lower prices, supply, demand, uh, I would say keep a very strong eye on actual data. Don't don't be listening to people that say, oh, uh, in a higher interest rate environment, there's always a recession because this thing inverts and this thing happens. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily true, um, especially in this cycle. And yeah, I just keep on keeping on. I think uh, we're in good spirits here. And there's been some very public wins. I think on my side, there's been some very public failures uh, on my side. But uh, that's how you make money in these in these uh, in these type of environments. So yeah, so I think that's that's about it. And I'll be back. Uh, I'm back on my Twitter now, posting daily supply, demand, inventory, other information. And and I I really hope to be back on the Zoom session train here as well uh, as soon as possible. It's it's just taken way longer than I figured, uh, and one thing after another has kept me down. So we will uh, get back on there and uh, rally the troops per se. And uh, yeah, let's just keep on keeping on. No, not really too much else to share, except uh, yeah, I think I think we're in a good spot here. We've we've uh, we've suffered through some very interesting times over the last eighteen months, maybe twenty four months at this point, and uh, the time has come to shine. So excited for the next uh, the next twenty four months and what it brings. And if people want to follow your work, where do they go? Twitter or something. Yeah, so the website whitetundra.ca, uh, all my portfolios are on there, my future events, and then the archived seminars and all the YouTube recordings are on there as well. And then uh, Twitter, white tundra SG. Uh, if you go on there, you can um, DM me, follow me along. And I hope to do some very interesting Twitter spaces in the next uh, couple of weeks and then a couple of months. So we're we're now 100% back. And I'm I'm very excited to create content again. I'm, I moved apartments here. And we've set ourselves up here uh, in this new gig. And uh, yeah, I think we'll continue sharing the gospel of, of oil and gas evaluation, investments, geology, engineering, and uh, look forward to, uh, yeah, just look forward to continue to be a part of this very, very small group of people that invest in oil and gas uh, in the world. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, we'll catch everyone else next time. See ya.